So probably all of us are uh, aware, like what an exciting time it is for quantum computing, right? Um, you know, we're, we're starting to see that quantum computers, uh, which are these like fundamentally uh, different types of, uh, it's like a different method of computing uh, is, is starting to like emerge in the real world. Um, and, you know, for a long time, they were just like theoretical constructs. Um, but, you know, now we, we hear of like companies like Google and IBM and Intel and, my, and like, you know, these startup companies, you know, they're racing to build these machines and trying to figure out how to make them solve useful and interesting problems. Um, and I think, you know, a bunch of you are probably involved in uh, uh, thinking about these sorts of things. Uh, this class, though, it won't be talking so much about uh, building quantum computers or, or even, you know, uh, designing algorithms uh, for them. So that's not really the, the focus of this class. Um, but instead, uh, we're going to talk about uh, another reason why quantum computing uh, has been so exciting um, these days. And, and that's because uh, it's giving a bridge between many diverse areas of science, engineering, and mathematics. Okay. Uh, you know, you see all these topics here that, that look very different, you know, normally aren't, don't look related to each other. Um, uh, but yet quantum computing is is a bridge between them all. Uh, and as a bridge, it's causing basically a, a cross fertilization of ideas that, you know, pushing the frontiers in, in all these uh, fields. Um, so this class is really going to focus on this aspect, like how quantum computing uh, as, you know, both a, a, a technical and conceptual field, it's giving us uh, insights into things like condensed matter physics or complexity theory or you know, pure mathematics. So the, you know, the theme of this course is specifically going to be on something I, I call uh, the complexity of entanglement, All right? And uh, I'm going to explain what that means uh, and I'll have to uh, go into a little bit of history uh, to do so. All right, so let's go back way, you know, to the way back to the beginning of uh, the 20th century. Um, back in the 1930s, you know, physicists were trying to grapple with this new explanation of nature uh, that was called quantum mechanics. You know, it was just being worked out and it was just really strange. Um, and it has all sorts of weird, you know, concepts that, uh, you know, you've heard of like things like, you know, wave particle duality or superposition or the uncertainty principle or entanglement and things like that. And the, all these things were like super weird and they were just trying to figure out like, how does this relate to our previous worldview, our previous like understanding of nature? And it didn't take long for, you know, the, the leading physicists of the day to, to key in on a, a, a one of these strange things called entanglement. And they realized that this was really more strange than these other things I've mentioned. So like in particular, uh, in 1935, uh, Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen, you know, they were thinking really hard about this new theory. Uh, they realized that this quantum entanglement uh, led to an apparent paradox, okay? Um, and, you know, quantum entanglement basically is this phenomenon where you can have two particles uh, where, you know, the, the the state of these two particles can't be described as the state on one particle uh, with, you know, separately the state on another particle, like their identities, their, the state is, you know, intimately linked in, in some very strange way. And uh, Erwin Schrodinger had this famous quote, you know, Erwin Schrodinger, Schrodinger is like one of these, uh, uh, you know, famous founders of quantum mechanics. He says that uh, I would not call it entanglement uh, one of, but rather the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics that enforces its entire departure from classical lines of thought. Okay. Uh, and so this is a pretty powerful statement. It really shows that he kind of understood like what one of these key things that makes quantum mechanics so different from classical physics. Um, but still, you know, even though they kind of had this feeling, they had this idea, they didn't really understand why it was different. They just, they just really had this feeling. And it would really take until um, basically 30 years later be before we actually started having a concrete idea, explanation of why it was different. Okay. 
And, um, <clears throat> you know, in 1964, uh, there was this monumental insight, this realization in physics that comes from John Bell. It's called Bell's theorem. And Bell's theorem uh, rigorously shows that this entanglement phenomenon is inherently non-classical. Okay. Uh, and more importantly, uh, John Bell came up with an experimental uh, a proposal for an experiment that would show this. And to sort of get a sense of like how radical this is, you know, basically his theorem is saying that this, there's a prediction that quantum, that quantum mechanics can make um, about entanglement uh, that no classical theory, uh, you know, they're not, he's not even talking about just one specific uh, classical theory. He's saying all possible classical theories that you can come up with, as long as they're reasonable and you know, they obey um, reasonable things like, you know, uh, light can't travel fast, you know, you, things can't travel faster than the speed of light and so on. Uh, all such theories, no matter how you like try to uh, uh, work it, it cannot reproduce the same predictions as quantum physics. And you can run this experiment and you can see that what comes out in the real world is something that matches what quantum physics proposes. And that tells you that nature cannot behave according to uh, a classical theory that uh, you know, people like Einstein would have wanted. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this later today, um, but this is, you know, sort of uh, how entanglement played a central role in these, you know, the, these early days of quantum mechanics when people were trying to figure out, uh, you know, what it all means. You know, but despite all of this, um, you know, people figured this out, John Bell figured this out, and uh, but entanglement still didn't really play a very important role in physics uh, for many years. Um, for most of, uh, uh, you know, physics in the 20th century, you know, uh, people were focused on things like, you know, finding exotic new particles and, uh, you know, figuring out like the, the standard model of, of particle physics and so on. And all those things didn't really involve so much thinking about uh, this entanglement phenomenon. Uh, and actually, I think, uh, you know, as far as I understand, even today, like if you're a physics major, and I think a lot of you uh, have a physics background, um, I believe that when you take classes, intro classes to quantum mechanics, uh, people barely mention quantum entanglement, if at all, right? Uh, although I'd be interested to hear if anyone has a different experience. So, you know, that, this was the early days of uh, physics. Um, but let's fast forward to starting in the 1980s when people started thinking about something called quantum information. And this is where you know, information theory, uh, computer science, and quantum physics start colliding. And now entanglement starts to take more of a center stage in, uh, in people's thinking about quantum physics. And the reason for this is that people started realizing a, a bunch of things. Number one, Entanglement in quantum physical systems is a barrier to efficient simulation, right? So entanglement is the reason that if you have n particles, uh, to describe them classically would require at least two to the n uh, parameters uh, to fully describe the state, right? An exponential number of parameters. And uh, for, you know, uh, for not, you know, and that's not small, this is just way too large, right, to describe. And this is a reason why uh, trying to simulate quantum physics on a classical computer, on the computers that we're used to today, is, is really an intractable task. Like, we don't know how to do this efficiently. And it makes uh, understanding quantum uh, physics very difficult if we want to uh, try to simulate. But on the flip side, people also started realizing that entanglement is like a really useful information processing resource. So it's, entanglement is not just this weird thing out of nature where you have these like linked particles and, and so on, but you can actually use it to perform interesting communication or uh, information processing tasks. Like you can use quantum entanglement uh, to generate uh, perfectly secure um, secret keys between two distant parties that they might want to use for a cryptographic task. Uh, you can also use entanglement for uh, teleporting quantum states between one place and another. Uh, and so on, right? So uh, once people wanted to do something with 
uh, this quantum entanglement, then they started realizing, well, we have to understand it better. Uh, and also, like from just a, a fundamental physics point of view, people uh, are starting to realize that entanglement is behind like some really exotic qu quantum phenomena that you see in nature, like things like superconductors, right? So this thing on the left-hand side is a picture of um, a superconductor. Uh, it's this little puck at the bottom, uh, and you know, cool to uh, you know some really low temperatures, uh, and it generates the you know things like this levitating cube. Okay. Um, and, and really the, the reason that superconductivity is possible is, is people believe it. it's because of uh, very large scale uh, quantum entanglements between many particles. Um, things like the, you know, the Bose-Einstein condensates are, are uh, due to entanglement. Um, and even things that are like super large and like cosmic in nature, black holes, um, black hole evaporation, people believe it, it's, uh, it's due to uh, quantum entanglement. Oh, sorry, I, I realized I, I didn't advance the slide. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, so here, here are the three different pictures that, that I was uh, alluding to. Okay, um, so back to this theme that I was mentioning, the complexity of entanglement. Um, well, what do I mean by this? It's, it's a computer science and information, information processing perspective on it on this phenomenon. And this perspective has given birth to uh, a bunch of really uh, interesting questions um, that on the surface just seem completely unrelated. So here are some examples of these questions. Number one, can quantum systems that you find in nature, can you describe them using a small number of parameters? And if so, can these descriptions be efficiently found on a computer, classical or quantum? I just mentioned that entanglement uh, is useful for information processing, but can unentanglement be useful? Okay. What, you know, what does that mean? We'll talk about that later. Can complex entanglement, like the types that you find in uh, superconductors, uh, can they persist at room temperature? So this is one of the holy grails of engineering physics. Can you design uh, a superconductor uh, that has its superconducting properties happen uh, not at you know uh, near absolute zero, but say closer to um, room temperature. Okay, this is a big open question, um, and apparently it has one can frame this in such a way that it can be connected to something that's called the probabilistically checkable proofs or PCP theorem uh, that comes from classical complexity theory. So that's something that's just pure computer science. Um, there's like actually it turns out a, a deep connection between that uh, and uh, the, the notions of whether complex entanglement uh, can persist at, uh, at high temperatures or high energies. Okay. Here's something uh, pretty different. Is it possible to verify a quantum computation using only classical resources? And here's another one. What is the complexity of something called quantum multi-prover interactive proofs. Okay. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, and whatever that thing is, what does it have to do with whether nature can be finite or infinite dimensional? And furthermore, what can this tell us about long-standing open problems in, in pure mathematics, right? uh, specifically functional analysis and operator algebras? So this is like a wild collection of, of uh, uh, different questions. And in this class, we'll see how all of these questions relate to each other. And um, a lot of them are, are active areas of research. We don't have the answers, uh, but for some of them, uh, we do have answers uh, and we'll learn about that. So, you know, so this is like a, a brief introduction uh, to, to what this class is, is going to cover, at least thematically. Um, any questions uh, so far before I jump into things like the uh, the class mechanics. Oh, sorry. I just I just saw everyone's uh, message about the picture.
Okay, uh, so let's go on to um, administrative things about how this class is going to be run uh, and, and, and what's its style. Uh, so this class is going to be a theory course. Um, so, you know, we'll be proving things. Um, but the, the math is not going to be very difficult, I, I don't think. Uh, but really, I would say that the most challenging part of this course will be uh, its conceptual aspects. I mean, we're going to talk about all sorts of different uh, topics, you know, from, from physics, from complexity theory, from, um, uh, you know, from cryptography and so on. Uh, and we're going to mash all of these concepts together. Uh, and so really trying to wrap our heads around it, that's going to be the most uh, interesting and, and, and you know, mentally challenging part. Um, and really the goal of this course uh, is going to uh, be introducing a, a new way of, of thinking about quantum entanglement uh, and how can we use it, uh, you know, how can we think about it, how can we analyze it. Uh, and in this course, uh, and also, uh, you know, in life in general, uh, curiosity and open-mindedness is, is going to be the, the key to happiness. Okay, so what do you need to know uh, for this course? What are the prerequisites? Um, not a lot, uh, but I'm going to assume that you're very comfortable with some basic things. Uh, things like you know, just, you know, mathematical proofs. You should, you should be comfortable with uh, uh, seeing a mathematical proof and understanding it, how it works. Um, basic linear algebra, okay? Uh, I won't uh, use anything more than uh, you know, first year linear algebra. Uh, but it's basically, I'm going to assume that you're very comfortable and, uh, you know, you, you've seen it a lot. Uh, in terms of notation, uh, I'm going to assume that you, you're familiar with uh, this Brockett notation for, that's used in quantum mechanics and quantum information. Uh, you know, concepts like tensor products, uh, measurements, density matrices, um, you know, basically I'm going, going to assume that, um, and, and we're going to see a little bit of quantum circuits, but you, don't, you won't need to know any specific quantum algorithms or, or anything like that. Uh, a good benchmark for seeing if you uh, are comfortable with these prerequisites um, are the first two chapters of Ronald DeWolf's uh, lecture notes on quantum computing. Um, there's a link to it uh, in the class syllabus, so you can uh, take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> even if you feel like you're a little rusty on this or you might have not even seen some of this, uh, it's okay as long as you're uh, willing and motivated to, to learn these things on your own and on the fly. Um, and if you're not sure, just feel free to send me a message and, and ask me and, and talk to me about it. Uh, be more than happy to, to help you figure out whether you, uh, you have the appropriate background. And uh, it'll be really helpful, uh, but not necessary. Uh, but if you have background, at least uh, one of these topics, um, you know, say like theory of computing, like you've taken an algorithms or complexity class before, um, or, you know, you, maybe you come from a math background and you have some functional analysis uh, class that you've taken, or you're, maybe you're, 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 you're a physics major, um, that'll be really helpful because it'll give you a way to, it'll sort of give you an anchor to, to understand certain parts of the course and from which you can, uh, you know, understand the other, uh, you know, the other parts. Um, but uh, really, we're going to, like I said, we're going to learn a bit of everything, right? We're going to cover some physics, some, you know, pure mathematics, some complexity theory. Um, so, you know, if you're a physicist, get prepared to learn about some uh, theoretical computer science. Uh, if you're a computer scientist, maybe uh, you'll learn about some uh, function analysis for the first time. Uh, good. Okay, uh, now let me turn to uh, the syllabus and continue with that. Um, good, okay, so, so this is like the, the class information. Um, the course website, this is where I'm going to post things like the lecture notes, um, links to recordings of uh, the lectures, uh, and also the uh, problem sets. Okay, so, so all, almost all of the, the, the things will be posted up there. Um, uh, we're going to use Slack as a way to uh, just discuss and uh, uh, you know, ask questions in this course, um, you, like, or ask questions about like the problem sets or the lectures or, or just talk about uh, things related to the course in general. So uh, I uh, highly recommend that you uh, join the Slack and it'll be a way for us to, to keep in touch with each other uh, throughout this course. Um, 
we're going to use the Zoom link. Uh, hopefully the, the Zoom link won't change. Um, and you know, you, since you're in this uh, lecture, you, you have this uh, passcode. But if you lose it for any reason, you can just uh, email me. Let's see. Um, we talked about the prerequisites. Uh, okay, so uh, in terms of um, coursework, uh, it, the grading consists of a bunch of things. One is, uh, ten, you know, there's 10% participation. Um, that's pretty easy. All you know you have to do is just uh, be engaged in class. You know, ask questions, um, uh, as well as you know, asking and answering questions on the Slack channel. Uh, and uh, for those who are in like a, a very weird time zone, uh, you know, who can't make the class, then uh, that will you know be counted uh, in terms of like participation in, in the Slack channel. Um, so hopefully we we get some uh, lively discussions up, uh, especially once we we start getting the the problem sets up. Uh, Twenty percent of the class will be uh, scribe notes, uh, and. Uh, each lecture will be scribed by, um, I think based on the, the course enrollment, uh, will be uh, by two people. Um, and uh, you know, so, so I'll, I'll uh, set up a, a sign up sheet um, where people can volunteer for, uh, sign up for, for different lectures that they wanna scribe for. Um, I'm going to provide a, a LaTeX template uh, uh, pre-filled with some of my rough notes that I've written for myself uh, and then what you and your partner will do when, when scribing a, a lecture is uh, you'll just sort of fill in the details and make it nice. And, uh, you know, ultimately these uh, scribe notes will be posted online, um, not just for uh, this class, but also for other people uh, outside who are interested in this material. Um, and, you know, they can read it and, and use it for, for themselves. Uh, okay, good. So, so the next part is problem sets. Uh, I think there's going to be three problem sets in this course. Um, collaboration on problem sets is encouraged, uh, highly, highly encouraged, uh, but please keep your group sizes to three or less. Uh, and when you write up your problem solutions, uh, your write-ups should also have the name of your collaborators uh, and everyone has to submit their own solutions. And we're gonna use something called Crowdmark. Um, maybe some of you have seen this before. It's just an online submission uh, website where you can just upload your uh, your homework. And then finally, outside of the uh, problem sets, there's going to be a final project in this course. Um, and in pairs, uh, basically, it's just a chance for you to uh, explore a topic of your interest a little more deeply. Um, so you're going to uh, pick some topics. I'll have a list of uh, suggested topics that you can uh, read. Uh, you can read the relevant papers and, and write a short report of, of what you learned. Um, if you want to do original research, uh, that'd be awesome, super great, uh, but you don't have to. You can uh, uh, do, at the very least, you should do like an in-depth survey uh, of, uh, of the particular topic. And, and later in, the, in a couple of weeks, I'll post uh, a project guideline. Let's see, uh, what else? Um, some important dates. Uh, in the syllabus, I've written a list of topics that we'll cover. Uh, there's, there's 12 meetings of this class, and uh, so there's, there's 12 topics. Um, yeah, so, so that's the, the course mechanics. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, may, I, may I ask if, uh, are we going to get to a point where we'll be able to um, have an overview of the, of the uh, proof of the cons and bearing problem? Uh, hopefully, yeah. So um, this will come a little later in the course. So in this section where it talks about MIP star equals RE, uh, those two lectures will be devoted to covering the connection between this con embedding problem that you mentioned and uh, and MIP star equals RE and show the connection and also talk about, uh, I mean, we won't be able to see all parts of the proof because it's quite long, uh, but at least the, the basic concepts and, and the, the outline of, of what's going on. Thank you.
Any other questions? Okay, um, so let's jump into the, the first, uh, you know, the first main lecture. So today we're going to do a, a very quick quantum information refresher. Um, you know, I, I said that I'm going to basically assume that you've, you've seen it before, you're comfortable, but it's always, always helpful to uh, just get a, a very quick refresher. And, and in particular, we're going to talk about Bell's theorem, the, the thing that I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and, and talk about, in particular, this thing called the CHSH game. Uh, so I'll, I'll start that for the next, talk about that for the next 30 minutes. We'll take a five minute break and, and then continue on. So let me now turn to this notepad. Hopefully everyone can see it. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, actually, speaking of which, um, so would, so uh, I need two scribes for today. Uh, would anyone like to volunteer for for scribing today's lecture? Uh, and it, it's it's pretty simple because you know actually most of the notes are done. You just have to like turn them into complete sentences and and so forth. Okay, Abhinav, great. And Dipanchi. Okay, cool. So we have our first two uh, volunteers. Um, let's get into it. So brief quantum info refresher. All right. Uh, so let's talk about what a d-dimensional quantum state is. Right, so this is going to be represented by ket psi, and it's a some linear combination. It's a superposition of d classical states. So i is an index that runs from one through d. It has some amplitude alpha sub i. Okay, and this is a d-dimensional unit vector in complex space. Right. So we should be very familiar with this. And if you take this quantum state, this d-dimensional system, and you measured it in the standard basis, if you measure psi, so what, what does this mean? The standard basis is, is just uh, the basis that's spanned by each of these uh, elementary vectors, ket one, ket two, up to ket d, uh, you're going to obtain uh, an outcome. You're going to obtain one of these uh, d classical states uh, with probability the norm of alpha i squared. Right? Okay. And furthermore, your state psi it collapses, uh, it, it gets changed. So state psi collapses to the state i. So if you measure it again, you're just going to get the outcome i again with 100% with, uh, probability. Right. Um, so uh, you know, the, in particular, when, when d is equal to two, when the dimension of the system is two, we call this uh, a qubit. Um, and, you know, one way to visualize it is it's just, you know, some vector in the, you know, two dimensions. So this is our state psi, it's a unit vector. And when you measure, you're just projecting it on, onto one of the, the vertical or the horizontal axis. Um, of course, we can, we don't have to measure in, in just the standard basis. Uh, we can measure in different bases. Uh, and that corresponds to picking a different pair of orthogonal axes to project upon, right? So say you want to measure 
uh, in different bases. And so in the two-dimensional case, that would correspond to, uh, say, measuring not along the horizontal and vertical uh, axis, but say, uh, on, on, along this diagonal um, basis. Okay. And uh, again, if you have some uh, quantum state psi, this qubit psi, you're going to project it on the, the blue lines rather than the red lines. Okay. Um, and the probability of getting a particular outcome, whether you get uh, you know, this outcome, you know, let's call this outcome one or this outcome two, whether you get outcome one or two just depends on the, the length of the projection of your state psi on those, uh, those vectors. So, you know, more generally, let me, come on, oh, there we go. So more generally, like in higher dimensions, if suppose that you have an orthonormal basis of vectors, so V1, V2 up to VD, So this is an orthonormal basis for the space uh, CD. Um, orthonormal meaning that all of these vectors are, are unit vectors. Um, they're all orthogonal to each other. Uh, if you want to uh, measure a d-dimensional state according to this basis B, uh, then you get outcome i with probability, it's going to be the square of the overlap between the ith vector and your state, right? And here we're implicitly uh, associating each, you know, v1 with outcome one, v2 with outcome two, and, and, and so on. Right? And then the, what's called the post-measurement state, you know, the state psi will collapse to something. It's going to collapse to one of these, uh, you know, whichever vector vi uh, you got the outcome for. So the post-measurement state is going to be ket vi. Uh, and if you measure it again in the same basis, uh, it's going to produce the same outcome with certainty. Uh, if you change the basis, though, then uh, then again you'll you'll ha have a, another probabilistic outcome. So that's this is how you um, measure in a different basis. Let me generalize this uh, just a little bit. Um, you don't have to project onto single basis vectors. Sometimes. You know, you're working in d-dimensional space, but you want to make a measurement uh, where you have fewer than d outcomes. Maybe you just have two outcomes. And the way to do this is you can group different basis vectors together into a single outcome. Uh, and this gives rise to uh, a projective measurement. So a projective measurement. And if, you know, if you're confused about anything, just feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, and, and just uh, ask. Uh, sometimes I don't see the chat, so I might miss something. Um, okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, I'm gonna say a K outcome projective measurement, it's going to be a, a, a sequence of projectors, projection matrices, okay, P1 up to PK. Okay, so these are matrices that uh, act on uh, CD, so they're D by D matrices. Um, they're projection matrices, uh, they sum to the identity, okay, so 
and they're orthogonal. So if you take pi times pj, you're going to get zero if, if i is different from j. Otherwise, if you take pi times pi, you get pi itself. Again, that's what it means for uh, it to be a projection. Uh, so I walk up to you with this set of projectors, there's k of them, and it forms a measurement. If I wanna do the measurement on a state psi, you're going to obtain uh, an outcome You get outcome i with probability. It's going to be the norm of the projection applied to your vector, the squared norm. So you take your projection, you apply it to your state, uh, you get a number, uh, you, you get a you know a shrunken vector. How long that shrunken vector is, that's going to be the probability. Uh, another way of, of writing it is this is the projection matrix pi sandwiched by Oh, whoops, there's no. It's gonna be PI sandwiched by the state psi. Okay, so, so this is a number, right? Because you have uh, the transpose of psi, the matrix and, and the vector psi. Uh, and the uh, post measurement state Well, you're gonna take the projection and then you're going to divide by whatever this probability was. Okay. So this is, you know, this is a vector. Right, so hopefully this should be a, a refresher of uh, things you've seen before. Let's move on. Okay, so, so now we come to uh, something that will come up again and again in this class, which is uh, describing measurements using observables. Okay, what are observables? Um, well, it's, uh, it's a convenient way of describing measurements. Um, an observable is uh, basically, it's just a Hermitian matrix. Hermitian means that uh, the matrix is the same as its conjugate transpose. Right? A is equal to uh, A dagger. Um, so how does it encode a, a measurement? Well, suppose you, you had such a Hermitian matrix, right? Uh, observable, uh, let me call it, uh, let me call it M. So you have observable M. Uh, since it's Hermitian, you know that you can diagonalize this, this matrix, right? So diagonalizable, meaning that you can write it as the sum of one through K of some real numbers, lambda K times a projection, uh, I guess it's lambda sub I, times a projection P sub I. So, uh, you know, the, the lambdas are all going to be distinct real numbers. And the PIs are uh, projections. All right. Um, and the, you know, the lambda I is going to be the, the eigenvalue of this matrix M corresponding to the, the projector PI. Okay. So clearly, uh, once you've diagonalized it and you've found all these projections, they're, they're all orthogonal, they sum to the identity, so it specifies a, a projective measurement. Right? Um, Okay, what about these lambdas? What, what is their role? Well, there, there's some extra piece of information that's uh, in addition to the, the measurement that you're talking about. Um, and I think of them as uh, weights. So the, the lambda i's, 
our uh, weights. And um, the way they, they play a role is uh, you can use them to uh, calculate what are called expectation values of an observable uh, with respect to a state. So if someone walks up to you with an observable uh, M, and a quantum state psi, then you can compute this number, uh, which is the observable m sandwiched by psi. So this is going to give you a, a real number, right? And what does it correspond to? Well, if you open it up according to its uh, spectral decomposition, right, you're going to have these lambda i's, and then you're going to have the pi sandwiched by your state. Now, we know what this number is, right? This is the, this is the probability of, of getting outcome i if you did this measurement corresponding to pi. Uh, so it's like saying you, you measured the, the state psi with respect to p. Uh, and then you, once you get an outcome i, you're going to output the ith weight, this lambda i. So this expectation value is, is going to be the expected weight that you, you output, right? Um, hopefully that should make sense. Now, why is this useful? Uh, well, let's, let's think about the, the qubit scenario. So let's go back to D equals to two. Okay. Um, let me create a new page. So let's say you walked up to me with an orthonormal basis for two-dimensional space. So you had two vectors. I'm going to call them V0 and uh, V1. It's a basis for uh, C2. Um, rather than carrying around this, you know, these two vectors, all, whenever I want to talk about this particular um, uh, basis, I can instead package it into a single matrix. So I'm going to package it into this uh, two by two matrix, this observable that I call it M, and it's going to be the difference of two projectors. It's going to be P0 minus P1, right? And what's P0? P0 is going to be the projector onto the basis element V0. And P1 is going to be the projector onto basis element V1, right? Or another way of writing it is you can write P0 as the outer product between V0 and itself. P1 is going to be the outer product of V1 and itself. You can see that the way I've defined an M, it's uh, a Hermitian matrix, so it definitely corresponds to an observable. And in fact, I've just written down its spectral decomposition because uh, P0 and P1 are orthogonal projectors uh, and they sum to the identity. So that's something you can verify. Um, another thing to say about this, and this is kind of trivial, but the first basis vector V0, this is the plus one eigenvector of M, right? Like if you take M, you multiply by V0, you're going to get V0 itself. Uh, V1 is going to be the minus one eigenvector of M, okay. just by construction. All right, so uh, why is this nice? Why is this a nice way of um, writing down uh, measurements? Okay, so I see a question. Uh, Romy asks, uh, by weights, do you mean the amplitude of each orthogonal basis state? Uh, no, the, the weights, um, let's go back here. So, uh, right, so the weights, I, I mean uh, these lambdas. So here M is a matrix, right? So M is the thing that sort of talks, it encodes this measurement. 
uh, has nothing to do with a state, doesn't talk about a state yet. But you take this observable M and you diagonalize it, you get all these eigenvalues, these lambdas, those are the weights. Does that make sense? Uh, and what this expectation value is, it's average weight if you measure according to PI. Right. So, uh, you know, just to be pedantic, expectation values uh, are a function of both the observable and a state. Okay. If you don't talk about a state, then it doesn't make sense to talk about an expectation value. Good question. Um, okay. So, yeah, you know, I, I've taken this, <clears throat> this base is B and I've neatly packaged it into one object, uh, this two by two matrix uh, M. So M is a two by two matrix. Uh, and let's say I walk up with a qubit. So uh, psi is some arbitrary qubit. Uh, and I wanna know what is its expectation value uh, uh, with respect to this measurement uh, M. In the way I, that I've defined it here. So, so psi is a qubit, its expectation value. Uh, well, just expand it out. Well, it's gonna be P0 sandwiched uh, by the state minus uh, P1 sandwiched by the state. Well, we know what P0 is. This is the, this is the probability of obtaining outcome uh, zero if you measured uh, in, uh, in this basis minus the probability that you get outcome one. Uh, but we also know something else uh, about these probabilities. Uh, does anyone know, like what's the relationship between these, these two probabilities? They sum up to one. They sum up to one, exactly, right? Is you either have outcome, oh, great. They either have outcome zero or outcome one. So if you use this relation, then you get that this is also equal to twice the probability of outcome zero minus one, or equivalently, it's one minus twice the probability of outcome one. Okay, so for qubit observables, this is like a really nifty formula to have, like to relate um, expectation values of this observable with probabilities of getting outcome zero or one. And we're going to see really quickly why this is a, a nifty tool to use. Uh, this brings me to uh, an important class of qubit observables, the most important class of qubit observables. Uh, th there are these four matrices. Probably uh, a lot of you have seen these before. Uh, the first one's gonna be the identity matrix. You know what the identity matrix is. Uh, the next important one is, is the Z matrix. It's gonna, it looks like the identity matrix, but it has a minus one on the bottom right corner. Uh, the next matrix is the X matrix, which is the anti-diagonal matrix. And finally, the one that we'll rarely ever talk about, if at all, I mean, this might be the last time you see the Y matrix. It's, um, it's this matrix here. Okay, so these are called the poly matrices, named after the physicist Wolfgang Pauli. And why are they so important? Well, they, they have a, a lot of really nice properties. You know, they're the nicest two by two matrices you'll, you'll ever see. Um, one is they form a basis for uh, all two by two matrices. Basis for, 
Okay. They are unitary, meaning that if you take their uh, conjugate transpose, that's the inverse of these matrices. They're Hermitian. Okay. Um, they have, they each have, um, well, um, X, Y, and Z have uh, eigenvalues uh, plus and minus one, right? So they have one plus one eigenvalue and one minus one eigenvalue. Uh, they square to the identity. Like if you multiply them by themselves, right? Um, I mean, these are simple properties, but they're important. Uh, and importantly, X, Y, and Z all pairwise uh, anti-commute. Okay, so a question uh, Shang An asks, for two by two matrices, are you referring to real matrices? No, I'm referring to uh, complex ones. Uh, Walid is asking, uh, do I mean a basis of uh, Hermitian matrices? Um, he, no, not necessarily. Uh, if, if we take, allow complex linear combinations, then uh, it doesn't need to be Hermitian. Yeah, I, I believe they're the, um, yeah, they should be a basis for all complex two by two matrices. Yeah. Um, okay, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so what, what do I mean by parallelized anti-commute? I mean that if you multiply, say, x times y as matrices, you get uh, minus yx, or x times z equals minus zx, and, and so on. And this anti-commutation is, is uh, super important. We'll see it come up again uh, multiple times throughout this course. Uh, okay, so let me, let's do a quick pop quiz. Uh, so I've described these really nice two by two matrices. Um, they're Hermitian, right? So in particular, they're observables. And I've just told you how observables uh, are packagings of uh, projective measurements. So uh, what measurement does the observable identity correspond to? Like, uh, yeah, what, what are the projections? This one's the easiest. Uh, same as the original ones. Uh, I guess what I'm asking is like, uh, what, um, yeah, what it, what, it corresponds to some measurement, right? So uh, if you diagonalize it, uh, you're going to get projections onto um, what basis? Okay, how I think almost has the right answer. Great. So while he says it's projections onto x-axis, um, projections onto uh, y-axis, uh, that's absolutely correct. So we can write it as projections onto this particular basis. Uh, but of course, identity is diagonal in, in every basis. So you could have written any, um, you could have written uh, uh, any orthonormal basis here, right? Um, so, but it's, uh, but it only has one plus one eigenvalue. So it only has one outcome that ever occurs. Like if you measure the observable corresponding identity, you're always going to get one outcome, right? And it kind of makes sense. The identity shouldn't do anything. Uh, and it's not going to change your state. The post-measurement state of the identity measurement is just the state itself. Okay. So that's maybe a bit trivial, but that's, that's what it is. Um, it only has one plus one, we call it the plus one eigenspace. All right. Uh, let's see, the more interesting observables. So 
the, the Z observable corresponds to what measurement? Would it be the X and negative Y axis? Uh, X and uh, negative Y axis. Um, um, it's, uh, hold on, I want to make sure that I say the right thing here. Um, the answer is uh, yes and no. Like, okay, so, so here's a, a, I guess one thing I should mention is that um, when you talk about the negative y-axis, you, you mean like the, the vector uh, zero minus one, right? I forget uh, who, who, is, who, who asked this question? Uh, I did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so one thing about quantum states uh, is that, you know, they're, they're unit vectors. Um, you can multiply these unit vectors by any, like say plus or minus one or any complex uh, phase, and that technically doesn't change the state. Uh, so we actually kind of consider all of those vectors the same. Um, uh, so it's it's going to be uh, so Abhinav writes it's plus one. So the the plus one eigenspace is the projection onto the x-axis. And sort of alluding like to tie in what Kyle was asking earlier, this also could have been projection onto the, uh, the minus x axis. It's actually all the same. It doesn't, mathematically, it doesn't change the operator. Um, because when you multiply, I mean, when you're taking these outer products, okay, but this is kind of an aside, but you know, these outer products here, if you put a minus sign on, on this vector, it gets canceled out by a minus sign here. So, so the, these phases don't matter. Anyways, let me go back. So Abhinav is right. Uh, you have uh, the plus one eigenspace is, is the projection onto the x-axis and the minus one is projection onto the uh, y-axis. So, uh, you know, it's, it looks the same, right? Um, between the, uh, the identity and, and the, the, the z observable, the, the difference is that in the identity, we're bundling together the x and y axes as one outcome, whereas for the z measurement, we have we give them two different outcomes. Okay, great. So this is, in other words, another way of putting it, this is just the standard basis measurement. Okay. And uh, the last one here that we'll talk about before we take a uh, five minute break uh, is the the x observable? So what what measurement does this correspond to? And so re remember, x is this anti-diagonal matrix, and we we want to uh, diagonalize it. Uh, Sajad so says it is plus one eigenvector onto the plus state, so a projection onto the plus state. Well, what's the plus state? It's the equal superposition between uh, zero and one, exactly. And it has the minus one eigenspace, which is the projector onto the, the minus state, which is the same thing, except you have a minus between these, these two states. Right. Just to so just to draw out this is this basis. This is plus one and minus one outcomes. And uh, here for the x, we have a project. Uh, let me make sure I get my drawings right. This is the plus one axis, and this is the minus one axis. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah. 
and we won't talk about why because it's not not important. Really, the, the most important uh, poly matrices we'll ever talk about are, are Z and X. Standard basis and this diagonal basis, uh, the X basis. Okay. <clears throat> so how about let's take a, a five minute break. Uh, let's come back at 510 um, and we'll continue on.
Romy, did that nope. answer your question? Just unmute myself. Um, yeah, I did thank you. I'm just wondering, is it always those or can it also be just like the typical standard ones? Uh, like like zero one one zero. Zero one. Oh, um, oh, oh, so yeah, plus and minus the plus and minus states are are different. So the zero one one zero are the um oh, let me write it here. So zero uh is is this. Uh you can see what I'm writing, right? Yeah. And um the plus states and minus states are are the diagonal ones, so it's gonna be like this these ones. Oh. So so that's how they're defined. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. So let's uh, let's come back. Um, all righty. Uh, so we talked about what did we talk about? We talked about measurements. Talked about observables. We saw the most important qubit observables, uh, X and Z, um, identity, Y, I don't think we'll ever talk about. Um, is there anything else I need to mention about those? Okay, yeah, so it, you know, if, if this is going a little fast for you, then um, uh, you can take a look at, say, uh, Ronald DeWolf's lecture notes, or, or actually there's, you know, there's lots of different resources. Um, you can go to my website, I have a, a page that's called resources and it has links to different uh, lecture notes. So, you know, different ones appeal to different people and hopefully one works for you. You can use that as a, a way to refresh yourself or, or get caught up on, on some of this material. Alrighty. Uh, let's talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is a good place to, for it to come in. Oh, sorry, and then Shane had a question. Is the projection operator linear? Uh, it is linear. Uh, it seems linear from phi p phi, but not from the norm of p uh, phi. Oh, uh, right, so the projection operator has the property that if you multiply it by itself, so p squared is equal to p. So does that answer your, so maybe that, does that ex answer your question? Yeah, also free, uh, yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. It's sometimes easier to, to just chat over voice um, if it's convenient for you. Okay, so if that makes sense, then we'll, we'll continue on. Uh, okay, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You know, it's this, this thing maybe a lot of us have heard of, uh, comes from quantum physics. It says that, uh, you know, at a high level, you can't know the position and, and momentum of an object uh, simultaneously, right? Um, and you know, in quantum information theory terms, this boils down to the, the following statement, uh, is that uh, if you take a quantum state uh, and you can't, you know, this quantum state cannot be simultaneously determined uh, in uh, two different bases that are incompatible. So for example, two bases that we've just seen is one is this, uh, the standard basis, the zero one basis and the plus minus basis. These are incompatible bases because you know, they're, they're like not aligned with each other. Um, and what does it mean for a state? Uh, you know, the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that if you have a, 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 a let's say a qubit um, psi. So let me, let me draw the, So, you know, here's our, our state psi. Uh, suppose that it were determined in the, uh, the X basis, right? So that means it's perfectly aligned with, uh, you know, with this X basis. So this is the plus state. This is the minus state. <clears throat> so uh, if you measured in the X basis, you're going to get the plus outcome 100% uh, of the time, right? So, 
So psi would be uh, determined according to the plus minus basis measurement. But now imagine you took psi and instead of measuring in the plus minus basis, you measured in the standard basis. Uh, well, what would be the outcome? Right, so feel free to shout out if you know the answer. Yeah, like zero or one goes to fifty percent probability. Yeah. So the outcome is completely uniformly random. Right? So this state, you know, qubit psi is not determined um, uh, in the standard basis, right? It, it's completely random. Or conversely, if you have a state that's determined in the standard basis, then it's going to be uncertain in the X basis, right? So, I mean, that's really all the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is, is saying. Um, and you can make this more quantitative. You can say, well, suppose that a state psi is only uh, somewhat determined, you know, it's not 100% determined uh, in one basis. Uh, if you take a completely incompatible basis, um, uh, you know, then it'll, it'll also tell you how uncertain it is in, in that other basis. Um, but it, the uncertainty principle is saying that, uh, you know, there's going, you know, when you combine the two uncertainties, it's always going to be at least something. It's, it's always going to be at least, you know, pretty uncertain at least one of the bases. Um, Another way of you know, s seeing why this is true, uh, this comes about from the fact that the observables, the Z and X observables, don't commute. So it's a consequence. I mean, you can see it's a consequence of the picture I just drew, right? It's like very intuitive, but algebraically, you can see it from the fact that um, Z and X don't commute. Anti-commutativity, right? That's kind of a mouthful of uh, Z and X, right? So, so why is that the case? Um, you know, suppose for contradiction that there was some qubit psi that was determined in both the Z and X bases, right? So, if psi is determined, meaning that if you measure it in either basis, you get one outcome all the time, like with probability one. What does this mean? It means that the psi is going to be an eigenvector of these uh, two observables simultaneously. Right, so in particular, uh, if you took Z and applied it to Psi, you're gonna get some eigenvalue alpha times Psi, uh, you know, and this eigenvalue is not gonna be zero, it's gonna be plus or minus one. Uh, oh, and then Juan, yeah, Juan had a, uh, you know, guess the answer, it's because they don't commute. If you had, um, uh, you know, this eigenvector of X was say eigenvalue beta, beta is not all zero, but we quickly see this contradiction, right? So let's apply X times Z to psi. Well, this is going to be alpha beta psi, right? Just from what I wrote above. But on the other hand, X times Z as a matrix is equal to minus ZX as a matrix. And this is equal to minus alpha beta times psi. But, but that would mean that psi is equal to minus psi. And that's only possible if, if psi is the zero vector, which we're assuming it's not. So this is a, a contradiction. Sorry, so what is the precise definition of uncertainty? Uh, good question. Um, so here I'm using the most simplistic notion. I just mean that uh, if you measure 
a state in some basis that there's some probability of getting both outcomes. Or to, to put it another way, if there's no uncertainty, it means if you measure in a certain basis, you're always going to get the same outcome with 100% certainty. Okay, thanks. So you, you aren't making it uh, technical, right? Not, not a precise formula, let's say, for uncertainty. Uh, yes, uh, I, you know, the more precise statement would be, uh, you know, that if you measured, uh, let's say in the X basis, you get some, say some variance or some standard deviation that's measured by Delta X. Uh, and you multiply, or you compared it, if you measured uh, in the, the Z basis, you get some deviation then this deviation is lower bounded by some constant that's greater than zero. And uh, that's, that's sort of the technical statement of the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Thank you. Yeah. So, or, you know, the, rather the quantitative, quantitative. Yeah, but uh, that is conceptually, you know, the, and, but again, you know, this, you can derive this from the fact that uh, uh, Zx is equal to a minus uh, Xz, which comes from the same fact. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so this is Heisenberg uncertainty. Um, so this, now we can talk about the EPR paradox. Now the paradox I mentioned at the, the beginning of lecture. So what's the paradox? You know, Einstein and his friends were thinking about quantum mechanics and, and they thought about this particular state uh, called the, well, we, today we called the EPR state. They didn't call it that. It's a two qubit state, right? So it's going to be the equal superposition between uh, zero, zero and one, one. Okay, so it's, uh, you know, graphically it's two particles they're maximally uh, entangled. Um, and they imagine taking the, the you know, uh, two particles in this EPR state and separating it by vast distances. You just move, you know, put one in one end of the galaxy and the other at the opposite end, right? So we have uh, two particles here. Their, their shared state is this EPR state. And they started just thinking about, well, what are different things you could do to it? Well, you can measure the, 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 the two particles. Uh, and so let's imagine that uh, what you can only do are local measurements. So one person has one particle and the other person has the other particle. Um, and we'll call one person Alice and the other person Bob. Um, so let's think about different things they could do. Uh, let's say they both decided to measure uh, their particle in uh, the standard basis. Okay, or in other words, you know, they, they, they both measured the, the Z observables. Uh, okay, so what are the outcomes? What happens? So if Alice, you know, forget Bob for now, if Alice decides to measure her qubit, right, the, the left half of the, the EPR pair, uh, then what are the, you know, she gets zero or one, right? Uh, with what probabilities? One half. One half, exactly, right? So Alice is gonna see a uniformly random bit. Uh, what about Bob? So get whatever Alice didn't get. Or oh, sorry, the same actually. Yeah, exactly. So Bob, you know, Alice and Bob, they measure in the standard basis. They both get the same exact bit with probability of half, right? Because the, the state will collapse in either zero, zero or one, one. Okay, 
So, you know, this EPR pair allows them to, you know, get uh, totally synchronized coin flips um, and, and, and the coin flips are, are unbiased. Okay, pretty easy. Um, but suppose uh, each, you know, they decided, hey, let's not measure the, the, the standard basis, let's measure it in the, the X basis. Right. So when you measure in the X basis, you get two, one of two outcomes, either the plus state or the minus state. Uh, and what will the, the outcomes be? Or yeah, let's start again with Alice. So she's going to see uh, this, you know, plus and minus with what probabilities? Uh, is it the plus one with a uh, state with probability one? The, the plus, you mean the plus state, right? Uh, yeah, the plus state, sorry. Uh, it, sh it won't be with probability one. Um, be some other probability. Let's try the Alice. Well, maybe let's let's go through the calculation together because I think actually this will be um, instructive. So let me. Uh, so you know how how do we evaluate what the probability of getting a plus state? So we want to know what is the probability that when Alice measures, she gets the plus state. Well, we can mechanically calculate. So we want to apply the projection onto the plus state. So this is the projection, right? And this tensor identity means that Bob isn't measuring anything yet. So this is a projection. And we want to apply it to the EPR state. Right? And then we want to take the, the norm squared. So th this is the probability. Well, we can write, expand this out. Right, so we, we get a one over root two, um, zero, zero, plus one over root two, one, one. Okay, uh, and we can factor out this one over root two. It's gonna get squared, so this pulls out a one half in front, right? And we're going to move this projector. I mean, it, it acts only on Alice's qubit, right? So this projector is only going to act on, on um, those qubits, right? So, so what does that mean? We're going to do um, the plus state, right? This is a projector applied to the first zero tensor Bob state, which is zero, plus, you know, and, and I'm just sort of writing this out in like a very pedantic way, but hopefully this will be helpful. And this is going to be the projector applied to Alice's qubit one with Bob's qubit being one, right? Well, this here is a number because it's, you know, the it's the inner product between two vectors. What is the overlap between, what is the inner product between the plus state and the zero state? One over square root of two. One over square root of two, right? Um, you can see that from, well, you know, wherever we wrote the, the plus state. Yeah, so the, the plus state, the contribution of the, the, the zero is going to be one over square root two. So we, we just plug that in. So uh, you get plus, you get a one over square root two tensor zero plus, uh, again, the inner product between plus and one is going to be one over square root two as well, tensor one 
right? But you can factor out um, this one over square root two, we get a one fourth, right? Uh, or actually, you know, I don't wanna do that. But let's, let's keep it this way. It's one half. This is going to be plus tensor one over square root zero plus one over square root one squared. But just notice that this is nothing but another copy of the plus state, right? And plus tensor plus, this is a unit vector. The norm of this is one. So we're just gonna get one half. So the, again, uh, what we've just calculated is that Alice will get the plus state with probability a half. And already in this calculation, we've seen when this happens, what happens to Bob's side? Like what happens to Bob's qubit? What, what is his state now? Good, the plus state, right? You, you see here that, you know, when Alice does a measurement uh, and she obtains the plus outcome, then this is what Bob's state turns into. It also turns into the plus state. So when Bob simultaneously measures his qubit in the plus minus basis, he's always going to get plus. Okay, so they, so they both get, Alice and Bob get plus plus with probability a half, minus minus with probability half, right? So that's kind of funny. Um, even when they change their bases, as long as they use the same basis on both sides, this EPR pair is, is always going to have them have matching answers. Why did you use the plus states uh, when calculating the projection uh, rather than minus? Uh, well, because I wanted to know, you know, what's the probability that she gets the plus state. Uh, so that means I have to take the, calculate the projection onto the, the plus state. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. You just do the exact same calculation, um, but you replace with all minuses um, and you'll see that Bob's state will also collapse into the minus state. Uh, and, and where did that minus come from? Well, it came from this term. You have a minus uh, one, right? Uh, the inner product between the minus state and the one state is going to be minus one over square root two. So, so that, that's why it all works out. All righty. Uh, okay, so hopefully that, that, that makes sense. Um, where were we going with this? Good. So, so we've considered these two scenarios, measuring in the standard basis, they get matching answers, measuring in the X basis, they, they also get matching answers. And Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen thought this was really strange. Something was really fishy with this. Why is, did they think it was fishy? Well, you remember that Alice and Bob, you know, they're on opposite sides of, of the galaxy. Right, um, and you know, from Alice's point of view, you know, so let's say that she decides to um, uh, flip a coin to decide whether she wants to measure in the standard basis or in the um, the x basis. Right. So Bob has no idea which basis she's going to measure in. Right, because Bob's just way too far away. Um, she flips a coin and she measures, but what does she know? She knows that. Uh, no matter what basis she measured in, if Bob happened to be lucky and measured in that same exact basis, he would always get the same exact outcome, right? Um, but that's kind of weird because it would sort of say that, you know, this particle on Bob's side, it couldn't have known what basis Alice chose. So this particle, the, the Bob's qubit must have known uh, ahead of time Okay, sorry, let, let, let me back up. Um, so when Alice measures her particle in the standard basis, 
and let's say she gets a zero, right? Then she knows Bob's qubit also has to measure zero. So from Alice's point of view, this tells her that Bob's qubit maybe really was in the zero state the, the whole time, right? We just didn't know it. Like it's just due to our own ignorance or whatever, but really after the fact, we learned that it was in the zero state, okay? Um, but if Alice on the other hand decided to measure in uh, the, sorry, that, that's Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> If Alice decides to measure in the X basis, then, you know, let's say she gets the minus outcome, then she knows in her head that Bob's state must have also been in the minus outcome. Um, so, you know, putting all of this together, like Alice would reasonably conclude that Bob's state was both determined uh, as the zero state and the minus state at the same time. But we know from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that this is not allowed. Like Bob's qubit cannot be determined in these two bases simultaneously. Does, does the reasoning make sense here? So, so let me just kind of sketch that down. EPR said. So, uh, so fundamentally, what you're saying is that being a subsystem of a two particle system is distinct from being a one particle system because the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle doesn't apply in the same way to the one particle that Bob has here. Um, well, this is sort of what they were, they were confused about. They were, they were trying to figure out exactly this. Like they know for the one particle system, uh, Heisenberg's principle is definitely true. I mean, we, we just saw proof of it, but you know, they're trying to reconcile it with um, this same calculation that we did. And, and let me make it clear, like, you know, oftentimes people say that Einstein didn't understand quantum mechanics or you know, he, he didn't believe in it. I mean, he, he understood it extremely well. I mean, in fact, like, he, he discovered a lot of the principles of quantum mechanics. And he, you know, he, he trusts that the calculations are correct. But what is bothering him is, is, is the, basically like the interpretation of what's going on, right? Um, and and the, basically what they had in mind, and they had an implicit assumption, which is that um, each of these particles have like a, a defined state. Like, uh, you know, like basically, you know, EPR is assuming that because Bob is so far away, you know, the, the, uh, you know this, this piece of space and time around Bob's particle uh, is, you know, should in some sense have all information that you need to predict uh, the outcome of Bob's measurements, right? Um, and Alice's reasoning is, well, if I did the measurement A versus measurement uh, Z versus measurement X, uh, I would have gleaned some knowledge about what Bob's bubble would, would you know, what information Bob's bubble has. Um, and that shouldn't affect anything in his bubble because he's just so far away, right? So this bubble must have contained information about the Z and X outcomes, right? <clears throat> So it must have had some 
you know, little, like somewhere in, in like the fabric of nature or something, uh, there must have been like a little uh, indicator that said, if I measured in the Z basis, what would have happened? And if I measured in the X basis, what would have happened? Right? <clears throat> and, and, you know, Alice's thought experiment is telling you that, you know, what, however I measure it, it's going to uh, pin down what, you know, basically the Bob's qubit as being determined in both of these bases. <clears throat> uh, okay, so, so Gary has a question. I don't understand how this violates Heisenberg uncertainty. If she hasn't made a measurement yet, then uh, Bob's qubit hasn't been determined in any basis. Uh, I, so this is the thing that EPR didn't understand. Um, so, you know, they're thinking of like what's really going on behind the scenes, like what is mother nature doing? And I think what they intrinsically believed is that, uh, you know, mother nature is sort of like keeping track locally for every particle, what measurements on it is supposed to produce, <clears throat> right? Um, and, you, you know, if you look at the mathematics of quantum information, you, you know, you're right, like Bob's qubit isn't determined yet. Uh, right, if Alice hasn't made a measurement. Um, but what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen are saying is that, well, the, the mathematics of quantum information doesn't say this, but uh, it should. And so therefore it's incomplete. It's missing this, these extra pieces of information, these lambdas that I've just written uh, that would tell you about it. <laughs> um, so, so this is the, the thing that there was like, well, you know, there has to be a better theory of, of nature that uh, that explains all of this, right? Because otherwise it would sort of indicate that somehow by doing a local action on her part, Alice could, you know, instantaneously affect the state of Bob's system. And this really bothered Einstein. I mean, it, it doesn't affect it in a way that would allow Alice to communicate to Bob. But, you know, when you, when you look at like what's happening, like you're still collapsing this a quantum state in an instantaneous way. At least that's what the mathematics sort of seems to suggest. And, and that sort of thing like really bothered Einstein because, you, know, you know, he created relativity after all. Uh, and, and so they concluded, all right, there has to be a replacement theory for quantum mechanics that gets, you know, removes this instantaneous long range collapsing of states. Um, Okay, uh, Xin Chang is uh, asking, sorry, what does zero, zero, and one, one mean exactly? So those are, uh, uh, this, so this is a superposition of two classical states, you know, the two particles being in the state zero, zero, or the state one, one. Right, so like, for example, you know, like we saw earlier, if they both measured in the standard basis, they would both get zero uh, separately and, or one separately. Okay, uh, any other questions about the EPR paradox? Okay, so that, that was their hope. They, they wanted a nicer classical theory, you know, some theory that, you know, it's nice and classical, or makes more sense, that, that's consistent with um, the quantum theory. <clears throat> uh, so before, I think you mentioned that when the plus axon zero, zero, it axon one root two. Uh, so the plus doesn't, uh, it axon the first, you know, zero, zero refers to two particles, right? The state of two particles and the plus projection is, is just something that Alice is doing. So it just acts on the left hand zero or the left hand one. 
right? So, um, you know, when I say zero, zero, that, that just, you know, that's talking about two particles, uh, the left one and the right one. Uh, and the, what I'm saying is that uh, this projector, this, this is a two by two matrix, right? When, when considered by itself, it acts on uh, just the, the first half of this zero, zero uh, ket. Okay, uh, I think we're close to uh, When would it act on the second half? Uh, it wouldn't act on the second half. Of be so Bob's, you know, when Bob applies a, his measurement, then that's when it would act on the second half. Um, so, so for example, Bob's me projection measurement, well, let me draw on the side. Like, let's say, you know, we reverse the, the order of things. We said that Bob measured first, then his projector would be, would be this plus plus tensor identity. Like this identity means Alice isn't measuring yet. Um, and this is uh, Bob's projector. Right. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So Waleed uh, is asking, is the accepted resolution to the paradox that one has to abandon the principle of locality? Uh, let's see, what's, uh, what's a good way to answer this? Um, Yes and no. So, so I think it gets confusing here because um, these terms, okay. So one answer is yes. Uh, it's saying that fundamentally, like the only way to describe mathematically describe what's going on in a satisfactory way is to say that underneath it all, there's some non-local behavior going on. Like I do something in this part of the galaxy, it somehow changes the, the state at, you know, somewhere else in, in the universe. You know, that sounds really freaky, but it, it's not um, in a way that allows you to instantaneously communicate uh, with uh, someone at the other side. So it's, so in a some sense, it's like um, all the predictions that you would make uh, in your local part of the universe uh, uh, is local. Like you can explain everything just by saying, you know, the laws of nature act locally, it's just that when you combine the measurement results from one part of the, the galaxy with, you know, the measurement results with some other part of the galaxy and you bring them together and you look at, you say, wait a minute, there's some weird correlations between them. Uh, and it, it, these correlations are, are what are called non-local. Okay. Um, but before you brought them, these measurement results together, uh, you wouldn't have known that there was any non-locality going on. Okay, so maybe a, a, a vague answer, but it, maybe you got something out of it. <laughs> okay, Shen Yang is asking, what if EPR doesn't exist in nature for Alice and Bob? Uh, you mean the EPR state? Yes, uh, I'm saying that if it only happens if they are local to each other, then it's oh. not a paradox. Oh, good question. You're, you're sort of saying like, oh, maybe uh, for some reason it's not possible for Alice and Bob to be on opposite sides of the galaxy and share this specific state. Um, right, well, right, yeah. Uh, you know, that is possible, um, but that would kind of, as far as we can tell, that's, I mean, the only way that would be true is if, you know, the laws of nature change when you move to a different part of the, the galaxy. But assuming that, you know, the laws of physics are the same everywhere, then you know, people have been able to prepare these EPR states and distribute them over thousands of kilometers or maybe hundreds, but um, anyway, it's pretty far. And there's no reason to expect that you couldn't just, you know, if you're careful enough to continue splitting them up further and further apart. Okay, so, uh, you know, I have 10 minutes left. Um, you know, uh, maybe I'll uh, try to get started on uh, explanation of Bell's theorem. Uh, and uh, you know, I'll try to make as much progress on that um, before the class ends. And then I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Uh, Okie dokie. Uh, so that's the EPR paradox. They were very confused. And you know, this caused like all sorts of philosophical debates that just lasted for 30 years until in 1964, John Bell came along and said, um, basically, uh, you know, this dream of 
Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen of coming up with a, a nice classical theory that explains all of this, this is not possible. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Bell's theorem shows that there is no classical theory that respects locality um, that could explain all of quantum mechanics. Right? No matter how clever you were, you cannot fit a local classical theory around quantum mechanics. How did he prove this? Uh, well, I'm going to explain it in a modern formulation in the terms of this thing called a, the CHSH game. <clears throat> okay. Um, and this game, I mean, it was discovered after John Bell uh, and, uh, you know, the the way we explain it now is sort of like much simpler than it, it was originally formulated. Um, the way it works as follows, you know, let's take our two favorite people, Alice and Bob, and let's think of them as, as players in, in a game, right? So they're really far away from each other, right? Um, and so far that they, they're not able to send signals uh, to communicate, but instead they play this game with a referee who's in the middle. And this game is really simple. What the referee does is the referee is going to first choose two random bits, X and Y, uniformly at random. And the referee is going to send the bit X to Alice. I'm gonna call X the question because it's for reasons that'll be clear later. And uh, the referee is going to send the question Y to Bob. The moment that <clears throat> Alice and Bob get these questions, they're supposed to do something to like perform some physical process on their end, uh, and uh, they obtain an answer. So Alice is going to return an answer instant, you know, at that very moment, some answer called A, and Bob is going to return uh, an answer called B. These answers are also bits. Okay. And you're going to send it back to the referee. And at that instant, the referee is going to decide whether Alice and Bob win the game. And, and they win the game if A plus B is equal to X times Y mod 2. Okay. That's the game. It's very simple. Um, so uh, it's just one round. Um, Alice has no idea what uh, Bob's question was. Bob has no idea what Alice's question was, but they're still supposed to produce these answers A and B that, that s satisfy this predicate, this condition. Okay. Um, okay, it's kind of a strange game. We can now think, well, how well can Alice and Bob win, right? So Alice and Bob, they know the rules of the game. They know that this is what they're gonna be tested on. Um, so they want to come up with the best possible strategy uh, to win it with the maximum probability. Okay, so what is that maximum probability? Well, this depends on what Alice and Bob uh, are allowed to do. Like what laws of physics are they subject to? Okay. Um, so suppose that Alice and Bob followed a classical theory, like, uh, you know, they're, they followed some theory that uh, EPR would have liked. Right? So that means that Alice and Bob uh, use some classical strategy. So if Alice and Bob use a classical strategy, 
so what's a classical strategy? Um, well, a, a simple type of classical strategy is if Alice and Bob are deterministic, meaning that Alice's answer, A, is some determined function of, uh, uh, of her question. So, Right, uh, meaning that before the game starts, Alice and Bob they get you know they uh, they just plan on the best possible functions to to respond with. So Alice picks some function f uh, that maps a question to some answer, and Bob has he also comes up with a function, right? And so their their answers are just going to be f of x and g of y. So, um, yeah, the, you know, the, so the, you know, let's say they, they use this kind of strategy. It's certainly classical, right? They don't need to use any quantum physics in order to, to use this strategy. Uh, what is their maximum winning probability? Right? And the claim is that uh, they cannot win the CHSH game with probability greater than three quarters. Right, and uh, when I say three quarters, I mean over what you know what probability. Well, the the questions x and y were chosen at random, so over the choice of the questions, uh, they cannot win more than seventy five percent of the time. Right, and there's there's an easy way to see this. Uh, you know, basically, no matter what functions f and g, Alice and Bob you decide upon ahead of time they're always going to output wrong answers uh, at least uh, one fourth of the time. Right, and uh, maybe I'll just uh, end with this quick proof. So, you know, suppose you fixed F and G, then, um, you know, there's four possibilities, right? Because for the, her questions, so we're, you know, assume for contradiction that they, they picked uh, F and G that satisfied the, the game winning condition 100% of the time. So when, when X is equal to zero and, and Y is equal to zero, then this is the, the, sum of their, the sum of their answers, right? These are their answers is equal to the product of their questions, which is zero. If Alice gets zero and uh, Bob gets one, then you know this is still zero, also zero. But if they both get one, then somehow magically their answers uh, is also equal to one, right? Uh, and all of this is is modulo two, right? But you can easily see that there's a contradiction here, right? Uh, because uh, you know, if you sum up the left-hand side, you sum up all four equations. Since we're summing up everything modulo two, if you sum up uh, something twice, it just cancels itself out, right? So F zero plus F zero is equal to zero. F one plus F one is equal to zero. Same thing with the Gs. But on the other hand, if you sum up the right-hand sides, you get one, right? So, you, you know, we get a, a contradiction here. So it's not possible to find functions f and g that satisfy all of this, right? They're, so they can't have a deterministic strategy uh, uh, for winning this game. Like at least one of these conditions must be false. Right? Makes sense? Okay. Um, so that's, you know, if they use a deterministic strategy. Um, what if Alice and Bob use a, a, you know, not necessarily a deterministic strategy, but they're, you know, allowed to, you know, uh, flip random coins, 
you know, to like say randomize their strategy, you know, maybe that can help them win this game uh, uh, better. And I'll, I'll this, okay, this is really the last thing I'll mention. Right, instead of using a fixed function, maybe their fixed function depends on uh, some randomness that they, they use. Right, and what that means is that their functions, you know, uh, their answers, you can model it as, it depends on their questions, but some additional source of independent randomness are. So their, their strategy is uh, some function f of an r, and g depends on y and r. Maybe this synchronized r allows them, uh, helps them win, Well, the, the claim is that this doesn't help. Okay. This doesn't actually, you know, they might as well use a deterministic strategy. Um, okay, so, so that's it for today. Uh, what we'll finish up with next time <clears throat> is we'll see, um, you know, that uh, if Alice and Bob instead use quantum entanglement, they can actually do better than 75%. Okay. So it, you can do, you, you know, classically you can't do better than 75%, but using quantum entanglement you can. Um, and that tells you that quantum entanglement cannot be described uh, classically. Um, okay, well, so that's it for today. Um, couple of announcements. One is that um, please sign up for the Slack. Uh, it would be great if uh, you, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, introduce yourself, say, you know, said like, you know, uh, your status, are you a graduate student, what you're studying, what you're interested in. Um, and and that'll be uh, great for, you know, for finding project groups and, and, and problem set groups. Um, another thing is uh, I've released problem set one uh, and uh, you know, hopefully it should be a helpful way of, uh, you know, refreshing yourself in quantum information and determining whether you, you know, uh, whether you're, you're you know, you, the, you understand the background. Um, it's due September 21st, so about uh, several weeks from today. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that, that's it for today. Any questions? I actually cannot find the Slack link, uh, the invite link. Can you reshare it on the Quarkus? Oh, sure thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I it's in the syllabus, but uh, let me post it. I'll post it a couple times in different places. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, thank no, you very no. much. Uh huh. Yeah. I just have a question about notation again. Sure. So in the last example, you're using um, like f of zero uh, one, not of, but like f with the curly bracket zero one. Mm -hmm. Wondering what those are. Oh, uh, you, you mean this thing? Yeah. Oh, that's just saying that f is a function from the set zero one. Uh, so it takes in either zero one and it outputs zero or one. So it's a very, it's a function of, of of a bit and it outputs a bit. Okay, so it's not it's not a qubit. Um, no, uh, okay. it, it's just a like a fixed mapping. Like you can think of it as you know, it's just a, a table. You know, f is saying if I get input zero, uh, then you, I output f of zero. If I get one, then output f of one. Okay. I was trying to relate it to the qubits and I was getting confused. Okay. Oh yeah, here there's nothing quantum. Like so far I'm just talking about classical stuff. Okay, got it. Um, and then one more question uh, for the zero zero and the one one. Mm -hmm. I was a little confused. Um, like with the, 
with, I guess, why would it, it would apply to the first one and you would get one over root two. Um, but like in, in the first, in, in the first blue arrow. Uh -huh. um, I guess to why, why that would apply to the, to the first zero. And then you mentioned that you would get like one over root two. Oh, right. So uh, let me draw a little aside. Um, I think it might be just notation for me or. Yeah. So, um, so let's, let's forget, let's say there's just one qubit. Um, so let's say I had one qubit in the state zero <laughs> and I applied a projection like say plus the plus projection or let me say it again. I wanted to project the zero qubit onto the plus state. Okay. Uh, so mathematically that looks like this. I'm, this is a, a matrix, right? Because it's uh, it, the outer product of a vector with itself, uh, which is, uh, it's a matrix times a vector. So you're gonna get a vector, right? Um, yeah. But, but we're going to also use this nifty, like this is why this broadcast notation is, is uh, helpful because we can sort of move around these together. So this is the same as just plus, and then I'm gonna move the plus and the zero together, right? Like algebraically, this, these are exactly the same things, but uh, I'm gonna regroup them so that this, this is a, a vector times its transpose, and this is a number. Vector times its, uh, okay. Right, so this is gonna be like a, a row vector, which is the plus state times the column vector. Yeah. Which gives you a number. And then you're left with a vector. I mean, which all works out, right? Because you're multiplying matrix times a vector, you get a vector. It's gonna be the plus state times this number. Well, what is this number? Well, it's the inner product between the plus state and the zero state, which is one over root two. Like, okay. So right. it's, so it's not uh, just one over root two, it's one over root two times uh, this vector plus. And that's because we can rearrange the bras and cats. Exactly. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, and feel free to, uh, you know, use the Slack to ask um, questions. Uh, I'll try to uh, answer throughout the week and, you know, other people feel free to, to answer in. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, I think that's it for today. Bye, guys. All right. See ya. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.